In this lecture, we will cover the topic of shear flow in thin walled sections. Now, what do we mean by thin walled sections? Now, thin walled sections are those for which the thickness of the members are much thinner or much lesser compared to the overall dimensions. A classic example of thin walled section is essentially steel sections, which are you know used in steel construction, used in bridges as well as in steel buildings, for example, warehouses and so on. These thin walled sections play a very important role in the construction. I have a thin walled section over here. So you see, this is an example of a thin walled section where you see the overall you know dimensions, this thickness or the thickness of the of the top, the top part is known as the flange. This is known as the web. This is known as the flange again. So the overall thickness, this thickness as well as this thickness and this thickness, you know, the thickness that you see over here, they are actually quite small compared to if you compare it to the overall dimensions of the structure. So we will learn that how the shear stresses and the shear flows, it happens in thin walled sections. And you will see on an initial glance, it will appear to you as quite non-intuitive, but hopefully with the understanding of how the flow of shear or how the shear stresses develop in these thin walled sections you will be appreciate you will be able to appreciate it a lot more than someone who is not exposed to the concepts of shear forces or the shear flow in thin walled members right so that is our essentially our uh, topic of discussion today so we are going to talk about the thin walled section so let me just turn on my pen over here yeah so thin wall thin walled section so this is this constitutes our topic of discussion today Right. So now if you look at thin walled sections before we begin in looking into the shear flow of thin walled sections and so on, first let's see that what is going to be our saving grace for this one that why are some of the flow as you can see here already a bit like how the flow of shear and everything happens. But what is our saving grace for this one? The saving grace for, for learning about thin walled section is essentially something which you have already seen. right? Number one is the complementarity of shear, an idea to which you are already exposed to and you know pretty well, which essentially means that if you have a shear developing in one of the faces on the, on the corresponding perpendicular face over here, you have an equal and opposite shear that develops. So that essentially we had used, you know, this very idea itself to derive the shear formula initially. Now, this just shows in one of the faces in, in this face over here, you can have complementary shear in the other faces as well, something like this. For example, if you have a shear stress here, you will have a complementary shear in all across these four sides. Or if you are having this, you know, this vertical slide, if you have shear in one of the faces, automatically the shear develops in the other faces to maintain the equilibrium of forces and the equilibrium of moments. Now, one more important thing, which is somehow related to complementarity as well. If you remember when we had talked about these rectangular beams, what did we see in this one? In this one, we saw that the shear stresses are zero or negligible at the top and at the bottom, whereas the maximum shear stresses, the vertically down shear stresses happens at the center, at the neutral axis. Now, focusing on the top and the bottom, the formulation works out like that. And also intuitively, you remember that the shear stresses here are essentially negligible or zero simply because you do not have any shear on the top. So if you do not have any shear over here, complementary to that is the shear here, something like this. If you have one tau over here, you will have an equal complementary shear here. But, but here you have on the top surface, you do not have any shear. So the complementary shear will be zero. Similar to what you see here in the thin walled sections, which you will see that if you have, right, if in this in this kind of a section, right, if you have a shear force which is acting from you know across the surface, see here on the top it is essentially you know free of any load. So if it is free of any kind of shear that is there, so that means that there is going to be negligible amount of shear in this direction simply because here there is no shear, so no complementary shear develops over here. Similarly, here in these faces, in these side faces that you see over here, if there is negligible amount of shear, if there is no shear externally applied, no surface load which is over here, correspondingly, since this is all negligibly zero, this is also going to be negligibly zero, but you will have some vertical shear over here simply because the member is long and elongated, right? So you see that this complementarity of shear will play a critical role. So, so just keep in mind what we discussed. Since the shear here is zero, this shear will more or less be zero, this vertical component. Since here the shear is zero, this horizontal component for the web part will be zero. So this is the top, this is the flange, and this is the web, and this is the flange again, 
we'll write it out to you know to have the terminologies uh, particularly clear as well now the other saving grace in addition to complementarity of shear is something which you are also familiar with which is the shear flow now remember we had discussed the shear flow is nothing but the shear force per unit length on the how is that obtained you multiply the shear stress that is the tau that you have with the thickness t of the member to get the shear flow and the unit of shear flow since tau is newton per mm square remember the unit of shear flow since you are multiplying with one element of dimension it is going to be newton per meter or pound per inch and so on right and also the tau remember is vq by i times t so since you are pulling this t over here q becomes equals to vq divided by i okay now with these concepts being clear the complementarity of the shear and what is the shear flow let's go ahead and look at some thin walled section so the first thin walled section which we are going to look at is this i section over here so see this is what i what we wrote that the top part which you see over here is known as the flange this bottom part is also the flange and in between what you have is known as the web so these are very common terminologies in this thin walled i sections that you see now what i want you to do is essentially focus on one small element over here so suppose you take this dark gray portion that you see over here see in this part as i said that in the top part in the in the top face in the top face of your section essentially the top face of your section the shear is zero so that essentially means this particular shear is zero this, this vertical component is more or less zero over there now but you know one one very important thing you see this beam is subjected to this m and m plus dm over here now because of this m and m plus dm because of this moment you are going to have those normal stresses remember sigma equals to m y by i now where are these stresses maximum it is always maximum at the top and the bottom so for here if i am having a moment the stresses the normal stresses is going to be highest over here as and as well as over here maybe tension or compression depending upon the nature of the moment so if there is a difference of the stresses or the difference of the forces because you have m over here m plus dm over here what takes that particular shear what is resisting if i am saying that this kind of amount of this member is very thin and the shear acting along this is zero so what essentially takes that shear let's go ahead and take a look now for this member if you write it out this is essentially how it happens so if you take this particular section and say because of sigma equals to you know that m by i m y by i or m plus dm times y over i as a result of which maybe this is the is part of this entire triangular force that you have here you have f plus df and here you have f over here the essentially the force which is resisting if you write the force equilibrium again what actually happens is that at if you take a small strip over there this interface shear develops so this is a shear which is acting across this thickness about this particular direction so you see there is no shear about this about the, about the top over here but it's only acting about the wall right now what can we derive from that and also if you take a similar element on the opposite side it is essentially the same you have a f plus df over here f over here and here this df acts on this you know thin uh, thickness over there this f is not at the top remember although uh, it might you may be mistaken from the figure it is not acting on the top surface but on this you know thin uh, section it, it is acting over this thickness t across this face across the the face which is on the other side of this figure over here similar to what was acting it is acting on this face this df and on this side is acting on that opposite face that you have over here now what do we what do we get out of this and maybe you are already uh, getting a hint of how the shear is going to act now so you see here if this shear so this is the force now if i convert the force if i go from the force to the shear flow essentially q over here if this q is acting over here or the shear stress so q and tau all of them are related uh, q or the tau is acting over here because of complementarity you will have a shear about this direction over here similarly here if your df is acting on this phase because of complementarity you will have a shear force or a shear flow or the tau which is acting something like this so what does what does this lead to it leads to some very important conclusions first one is that as we said the top surface is free of any forces so if this is negligible right you see this is negligible over here if that guy is negligible so that means the complementary vertical shear that is also negligible because it's complementary shear is complementary whereas 
Here, this force must be appreciably large to resist this difference of the forces. Remember, these forces are maximum at the top when you're subjecting it to this moment m and m plus dm over here. It is appreciably high. This shear force is appreciably high. And because of that, the complementary shear is going to be appreciably high as well. And this is what it shows you that this and this arrow are appreciably high. Okay, so what you see that in the web, the shear actually the shear flow or the shear force is acting along this is acting parallel to this element over here. Take a look at this arrow. This particular arrow is acting parallel to this face over here, right? Okay, so that takes care of the flange. Now, what happens in the web? Let's take a look at the web. See, in the web, as I said, that the, on this face of the web that you see, there is no shear, right? So that means if you take a web element this side this side which corresponds to this side over here this side is the shear is negligible because simply because you do not have any force which is acting on this face over here so since this is almost zero this is also going to be zero because of complementary right so in this case which is the force or which is the you know direction of the shear flow or the shear force or the tau which is resisting your stresses yes these are these ones over here so if you take an element in the web in that case these guys over here that is q is negligible so this is zero and this horizontal q is almost zero whereas this is appreciably high and this is also the vertical shear is also appreciably high so you see that in the web the the component of the shear which is appreciably high it acts vertically down essentially again parallel to the surface of the web right so here it acts parallel to the flange and here it is acting parallel to the web over here now let's go ahead and take a a closer look into this one now we understand that what is the direction of the flow of shear which is happening in the flange as well as as the web so if you take these individual elements this is the flow of the shear that is happening or essentially q or tau if you want to call it let's stick with q over here because tau and q are related so if you take these small small elements over here you will see the flow of shear happens like this so q it essentially it acts parallel to the element side so at the top so this is this is very interesting it may appear a bit non-intuitive but more now that you have understand that where along which faces the shear is appreciably high along which faces the shear is appreciably low now you can understand that the q is appreciably high and it acts mostly parallel to the element faces so in the flange it is acting parallel to the flange in the web it is acting parallel to the side of the web which is over here so it is acting vertically down over here acting horizontally over here and note the directions i will come back to these directions once more so essentially what do we get if we now take a zoomed out view of this entire thing what you essentially have is a shear force v which is acting across this entire section because of the shear force v interestingly what you have now that the shear flow or the shear stress in the flange remember the stop part is the flange and this is the web and this is the flange again in the flanges the shear acts parallel to the sides of the flange in the web it acts parallel to the side of the web also one more important thing which also will make you think that why is this known as shear flow why is this word flow it is essentially like the flow of water if you think about it if you are pouring water from the top right imagine this v instead of being a force it's, it's like you're pouring water from the top the water must accumulate from everywhere go down and it must disperse out so this is exactly what is happening when you're pouring water from the top water is coming from the sides and from the top it is coming over here and then water is flowing out so it is just like the flow of water and you will see instead of i sections if you take some of the other sections depending upon the direction of the shear the shear flow essentially follows the rule that it is parallel to the sides of the faces and also it, it is see it is analogous to the flow of water water must come in and it must flow out in the direction you are pouring the water over there right so now that we have you know kind of understood that how the shear flow happens now the, the question is that 
what is the magnitude of these arrows remember for the rectangular beam we looked at the magnitude of the arrows were very small at the edges higher you know towards the center and again negligibly small at the at, at the bottom part over there right so now here the question is that what is the magnitude of these arrows it is going to be is it going to be very high here low here high here i don't know so let's go ahead and take a look at you know some of the uh, a case the cases where where we find the magnitude of the arrows now before we go there this is what i was whatever what i was telling you that this is how the flow of shear happened we just discussed the i section over here but this is again as, as i told you it is like the flow of water which you're looking at right so if you're pouring water from here water goes from here so this is the v direction of v it it it's it coincides with the direction of the flow of water if you're pouring water it goes from here goes out from here if you're pouring water from below the water accumulates from the bottom and then goes up similarly over here we're pouring water from the top water must come in from somewhere from these edges then it goes and then it flows out here similar for the other sections that you see that you see over there right now for the i section that we looked at right for this i section so this is this is what it is so if you have this force p which is equals to v in this case say right because it's an applied shear right how does these arrows which we looked at in the you know previous slide how does the magnitude of the arrows change as we are going from the edges to the center of the flange to the web to the bottom to the middle of the web and all the way to the bottom and it flows out. so let's go ahead and take a look at the derivation of how this q or the tau essentially varies